Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we have a few more people sliding in, uh, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, so appreciate you all coming here on time. Uh, just a friendly reminder, if you haven't already, to go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, the first part of this training will be uh, a guided slide deck uh, and then followed by a long discussion uh, with from all of you uh, into the details of the programs that you are all implementing. Uh, just a reminder that this will be recorded and transcribed. Uh, ACF will be able to share out this presentation uh, following the conclusion. Uh, I ask that you save questions until the end uh, or drop them in the chat uh, and we can follow up with them. Like I said, towards the end, we'll have uh, ample time to dive into any specifics that people may have. Uh, I want to highlight, uh, my name is Justin Van Zerber. I'm the Director of Programs with SupplyBank.org uh, in this capacity, uh, providing training and technical assistance through ACF. I have a couple other staff members uh, who have interacted with all of you, Christian Browning, our Special Outreach and Programs Manager, as well as Jessica Hernandez, our Director of Operations. <laughs> uh, it looks like uh, from ACF, Patrice is on the call. I'm not sure if anyone else is. I don't have access to uh, the list anymore, but really excited to have all these people together uh, having this conversation this morning. Uh, and with that, I think we'll jump right in. Let me pause this music. I forgot that it was going. Here we go. Um, so the objective of today is really to learn different approaches to enhance or strengthen your diaper distribution program. Each of these pop topics have different considerations with barriers and benefits for each of them. Lots of time at the end, like I said, will be allowed to discuss and learn from each other. Uh, and I want to acknowledge right now that each of your programs are unique and it's important to take that into account as we go through this process. Some of these approaches or recommendations might not fit what you're doing or what the populations you're trying to serve. So just try to be creative, uh, create space for yourself to explore how some of this content can be internalized and brought back to the communities you're serving in order to make the impact even larger. I also wanna note following the presentation, if additional guidance or training is needed, uh, the supplybank.org team will be available for additional training and technical assistance. While this is the first conversation about program implementation strategies, we can spend many hours exploring it and strengthening it, and we're happy to do that with you. The safety net is created to meet people where they are and provide them with the services that help them live a better life. Different people will access the safety net at different points for many different reasons. And today, I think we should reflect on your organization's goal and your pilot's goal. Use this to help you guide as you make choices on how to implement the programs. Are there gaps in services for the populations that you want to prioritize? How do you adapt your current structure to create flexibility to include them? Resources might be available to certain populations, and you can use that to layer these services. That might allow you to pinpoint a subset population that can be targeted and a larger program created. Various factors may contribute to one population participating in one program or the other. Looking and reflecting on that helps you identify the reasons and helps you paint a picture on how to ensure inclusivity. As stated on the previous slide, we want to meet people where they are. Your project may have a specific neighborhood or community where the data highlights the greatest need. This is where we want to integrate our programs into process or into structure that is already able. We want to utilize the resources that are already in the community and build on them. We don't want to ask people to go to a different location or to access a resource at somewhere that they're not familiar with. Funding is usually at the forefront of most of these decisions. How are we going to pay for staff time? Do we have staff capacity to implement this program? And I think this helps us guide 
into understanding is the scope and the scale of our intended project fit with this type of approach. And last, I ask that we try, try and try. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to launch a new program and to add on services to other programs, but the fruits of the labor show that it works and this helps us inform future programs and approaches. It helps us all learn together and strengthen the programs that we're creating for our communities. Locations have a huge impact on the populations that we're serving, the frequency of engagement that we're interacting with those individuals, the depth of the relationship, and noting the administrative burden. If you want to uh, select a specific population, you need to create access to that resource where they are. The frequency of engagement can, for large scale di uh, for food distributions, maybe once a month. But if you are engaging this into a child care center, you might be interacting with that family on a daily basis. Those are aspects that you should be thinking about when exploring ways to grow your programs. I want to highlight three of these approaches because they stand out to me as not the first choice for a diaper distribution. The first one is clinics. Uh, child, uh, children, young children may have to come in for checkups on a monthly basis or every three to six months. This is a great inner opportunity to interact with populations at a place where they feel safe and trusted. Additionally, Children might come in to get treatment for diaper related diaper need related symptoms. This is also an opportunity to reduce some of that trauma and stigma about on being unable to provide diapers for your family. You can use clinics as a referral service. If that family comes in and has urinary tract infections or diaper dermatitis, they might get connected directly to your community action agency or family resource center. The second one I want to highlight is libraries. This is a great way to connect with new members of the community. Again, people feel safe. There's no stigma, but the limitations here is there. There's a lot of people and you're opening it up to the general public. This creates a larger administrative burden for tracking and managing the distribution as well as the data. Uh, we talk a lot about in this program collecting and ensuring that data is accurate and that uh, you have access to it. This is much harder in a more public setting. And the last aspect with that is running out of resources. You never want to create a scenario where you're unable to serve all the people that you uh, invited. And the last one is schools. While we know that children uh, zero to three are not really in schools, their siblings are. And their siblings thus are enrolled in federal and state programs that are already identifying eligibility. Again, I want to go back to the feeling of safety. This is a safe place for families to go and be trusted or feel trusted. And thus those individuals are already identified. And so there's a lot of creative approaches that can be done with locations. Again, you want to reflect back on your model and your goals of this program in order to find the ones that work best. Mechanisms of distribution are only going to help you achieve your goal. Uh, each have obviously their own benefits and challenges, but you want to look at what your short and long term goals and which approach is going to best align with that intended outcome. Each mechanism will have its own depth of interaction. I was talking previously about the different locations and the frequency of uh, interactions, but this is the same as well. Maybe it's just that you want to interact with your community and connect them to larger resources, and so this is used as an outreach approach. That first interaction where you're building trust and layering access to those other services and, and programs. Maybe this is something where you're working on a long term strategy with one individual in order to find that pathway for them to be successful in their own environment. And so that is multiple interactions over a very long period of time. This also is a pathway for you to engage with difficult populations, hard to reach populations. Maybe there are barriers to travel, whether that's financial or physical. Maybe geographically they're too far from services. 
And so when you look at home visitation as an approach, this allows you to go directly where that individual is and eliminate all those barriers while still connecting them to that vital resource. Oops, apologies. So how are participants for this pilot identified? Is their participation in another program or subset of a group that is served by a partner? What are the eligibility requirements for each person? Recruitment can be done a variety of different ways. Uh, one approach is doing flyers and public notices within your organization. Uh, you can do it through case management directly to a client, uh, through your social media and website, et cetera. Be cognizant. As you start to recruit, uh, we have found that the need heavily outweighs the available resources. So it's important to acknowledge who you're recruiting and why you're recruiting before recruitment begins. You want to make these decisions based on quantifiable reasons. We want to help everyone, but again, resources are limited. And so staff, frontline staff are going to be the ones who have to say yes or no to an individual. And you want that staff feeling comfortable and empowered in order to make the right choice. No one wants to turn anyone away from services, but having guidelines and details about why or how someone is eligible helps eliminate some of those barriers. Uh, we encourage enrollment of participants in batches at different times, uh, onboarding when participants are falling off, uh, creating space for participants to rejoin after a lapse, uh, one approach to this is creating a, a wait list, having that uh, available so that when there are additional resources, while that person might not be enrolled for uh, the length of the entire program, they can begin to receive uh, services immediately. And like I noted within the clinic, I think you can take this approach in various programs is providing emergency yeah. assistance. Uh, sometimes people just need that resource right then and there. And while you might not have the space to enroll them for the length of the agreement, you could solve their problem today. And what that does is it builds that relationship and it builds that lasting connection that will hopefully encourage them to participate in other opportunities. Talk about engagement. Uh, all of you are coming from different backgrounds with different software within your organization or no software at all. Uh, these systems need to be created as robust or as simple as they are in order to track each participant in the frequency of engagement. Uh, you want to ensure that participants are getting resources on the cadence that you prescribed, as well as not gaining access to additional resources more than they are allocated. This helps to ensure that they're continuing to participate. Uh, this also may be the one time a month you interact with them. So thinking about what other services can be layered so that they can be connected to those additional resources. If they're being served multiple times a month, identifying a consistent approach for that distribution. It shouldn't be ad hoc, it should be prescribed. You want to let the participant know that on this date is when distributions will happen or following this service distributions will happen. Um, like I was referring to, you can use software or simple tracking sheets for each participant. Uh, this helps with follow ups. Uh, it also helps you stay on top of when a child phases out, whether that's for potty training, their age, their mood, other barriers from participating in the current program. Uh, that wait list will ensure that those who are unable to participate right away are contacted quickly, uh, and it's not a scramble to find additional participants. You want to ensure that staff understand their roles and responsibilities. Detail out the approach. Number of diapers per person, number of wipes per person. Again, that frequency. Is this on a weekly, monthly basis? What's the eligibility? What tracking needs to be done and what are the necessary steps in order for that program to be successful? This allows 
while we track all of this, it allows you and your partners to troubleshoot areas of concern. It allows you to reflect back on the data to see if there's populations you've missed or if your approach is just not aligned with your ultimate goal. You want to create a stable program for the end user. And you're doing that by creating this structure and ensuring that all of the details are aligned before people begin participating. Follow ups are follow up communications are vital to the longevity of this type of implementation. Diapers alone, as you know, are going to draw families in. But there's many barriers that these communities face each day, and we need to work with them to navigate that in order to create a more comprehensive approach to service delivery. Depending on how many participants are receiving diapers, that will dictate the frequency of follow-up. We're all, I'm sure, aware of approaches that can be made of phone calls, emails, text messages, flyers, social media, maybe even reminding through partner agencies about when your distributions are happening or which populations you're serving. Depending on the needs of the participant, it may also just need to be tailored. Through case management and through home visitation, I think are easier approaches, but don't leave people out because traditional ways of follow up don't help them. Tracking the participation of the participant is part of the reporting process and reflecting on it allows us to see those themes and reoccurring patterns. Maybe our phone calls aren't working and our emails are really successful or vice versa. But what this allows us is to dive into acknowledging that this population of people does not interact well with this approach and tailoring it and designing it so that again, your approach meets the population that you're intending to serve. Survey and data collection is a wonderful tool and also a, a, a struggle sometimes for our participant, our partner agencies to implement. When designing and adapting your program strategy, it's important to consider how surveys will be administered and how data will be collected. I think we're all well aware participants do not want to fill out a lengthy survey each time they come to pick up diapers. So how do we make the process stream seamless for them? How do we make sure that they understand the expectations before they begin participating? What's required? What is voluntary? And ex making that explicit, not only for the participant, but for your partner agencies. So that way they feel comfortable in implementing these types of programs. Similar to the follow up with this, you'll be able to reflect on how to simplify the approach. You want to reduce the amount of time that's needed on this, but also ensure that you're collecting valuable information. The adaptation of surveys is also important to consider. Uh, while digital devices are easy to aggregate data and implement, they may create large barriers for people who might not be as technologically advanced or might not have the same language we use, vision, hearing impairments, mobility, et cetera. And the flip side of that is paper surveys are hard to organize, uh, not only physically, but also then you have to aggregate the data. You're talking about pens and pencils and printing uh, folders to keep it organized. Uh, but the win here is that it's easy and quick for participants to fill out. You don't have to sit with them and guide them through the survey. It's something that you can give them and ask them to return. One other note I want to highlight here is sharing the results. Uh, as you can see, here's an example of a publication that our organization created uh, based on data that we collected in some of our diaper distribution programs. This document was shared across partner agencies as well as to potential funders. It's a real easy way for people to consume information. And it is why we collect data. We only don't want to collect data for ACF or for our funders, but I think it's also important to share that information with 
participants in your community. Make them feel empowered by how many people are getting access to this resources, these resources, or the impact that it's making. So in summary, uh, I think it's first important to identify the participants you want to prioritize. Uh, create those systems that are going to encourage participation. Revisit them. Use the information that you're collecting, whether that's anecdotal or through data, to strengthen those processes. Uh, continue to keep the participant at the forefront of your decision making. You want to prioritize that they are getting the best program that they can receive. And then lastly is sharing results. Uh, like I was just closing on data, let's use it. We have to collect it, so let's make sure that we're sharing it with the appropriate partners. Uh, and so that's it for the slide deck. Uh, this is again, really is a, a conversation that we wanted tailored to the specifics of each of your programs. There's a lot of different approaches out there that are successful, but they're unique to your community or um, your geographical area. And so I think what would be helpful now is if we can go back through the chat and see if there's any underlying questions that can be addressed. And then I'd be happy to go back into any specific slides uh, and dive a little bit deeper into conversations. I'd love to hear from uh, partner agencies as well as state agencies about what's working well, what are, what are some big gaps, and um, how can we continue the, to further this conversation to enhance the programs that you all are implementing? Kristen, did you get a chance to read through the chat by chance? We don't have any questions in the chat just yet, but if folks do want to drop them in there, we can read them aloud and answer it that way. And Tanella, feel free to unmute. Hi, um, so I am coming across a lot of discussion with my um, CAAs about what questions do or what serve, what needs to be on the survey that the participants are filling out. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I think we're still waiting, unfortunately, on guidance from ACF. I know that they provided um, one survey that should be implemented across uh, all of your programs that's aggregating the information or the data for them. Um, but I don't have that in front of me, but I can make sure that we share that, reshare that with you. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page because that's for my, I, that was my understanding also. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. And just to layer on that though, Antonella, feel free to get creative. And if you want to, expand on the data that you're collecting so it best fits what you want to do moving forward, right? I think while ACF is starting to aggregate this larger set of data, um, you might have specific questions tailored to the populations you're serving or the uh, programs that where you're implementing it. OK, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, Mary, I see yeah. a hand raised. Feel free to unmute. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Mary Reedy. I'm at uh, Iowa Community Action Association. Um, this is probably a question more for the other um, sites that are on the call. Uh, but uh, Justin, you're, you're speaking to it kind of was sparking some thoughts. Um, we're doing a lot of very like it's home visitation based. So we're doing delivery each month to families and it's very specific to what their usage is and their sizes and all of that. Um, but then hearing today a bit about um, kind of varying the techniques. I'm wondering if others are doing more of these kind of mass distribution days where people show up or if it's one time events versus kind of that ongoing um, just to get people interested in it. Because, um, right, I, I wonder if we're making it harder than we need to on our end by by kind of individualizing it so much um, rather than trying to do these these bigger distributions. So just curious if anyone is kind of doing both or doing those larger scale events. Um, since I know the consistency is part of this particular pilot, um, wondering how folks are tackling that. Would anyone like to share? Mary, I can kick us off with a little bit of our historical approach. Um, 
And while our organization is not funded through ACF for this program, we have been running uh, basic material need distributions as well as diaper distributions for the past 15 or so years. Um, and unfortunately, I think my response is uh, pretty broad because it really depends on what you want to do for your outcomes. I think home visitation is a great approach because it allows that individual to feel comfortable with their case manager. Uh, it incentivizes them to participate in home visitation. It reaches really rural areas or hard to reach parts of the community. So there's many benefits, but I think you nailed some of the barriers, right? It's uh, harder to implement because you are so specific to that one person instead of opening it up to a larger group. Um, so again, I, I apologize. I think it's kind of a broad response, but it really is into the priorities that you want to achieve uh, within your specific program. I would love to hear from others as well, though. If anyone is willing to share, is anyone else doing home visitation? No other hands. Christian, any other questions that came through? Yep, we had a question from Christina interested in the infographic. Happy to email that out. And also question, will the slides be shared to our email later? The recording and slides will be uploaded to ACF's website in upcoming weeks. Patrice, if you can hear me and come off mute, if you're available. Um, I'm not quite sure if we can email out the slides in a more timely manner, but Patrice might be able to speak to that if she's available. Hello, everyone. Yes, I can hear you and I will come off mute. The slides can be mailed, um, emailed out, but they do have to go through a process first to make sure that they are, um, I forgot, that they're compliant basically for us to be 508 compliant to be sent out. So they they will go out, they will be posted, um, but it is a process that it will not be immediate. Thank you so much, Patrice. You're welcome. I can ask you another question then is going through that and uh, kind of listening to a high level overview of different aspects to consider when expanding your program or strategies for implementation. Um, are there other topics or details that uh, we can revisit with you or dive deeper into that might be helpful to your specific programs? We really wanted to use this slide deck and this time as an opportunity to kind of brainstorm and explore. Uh, so happy to do that uh, either publicly or individually as people feel comfortable and as they progress into different parts of their program. Wonderful. I don't see any other hands or questions. Um, this is all of the content that we have prepared for this training. I know that we have another training scheduled for next week. Uh, you all should have received communications from uh, Christian or from your state agency. Uh, about when trainings will be available and their specific topics. Um, feel free to reach out to us directly if you have any questions in the meantime. Also very open to exploring the specifics of your program and helping uh, kind of facilitate or guide that conversation um, to make sure that you're meeting your goals. Mary, if you want to dive a little bit deeper and set up some time to chat, we would be happy to do that. Um, Christian and I can remain back on the call if anyone wants to stay, uh, but for the rest of you, enjoy the rest of your morning and afternoon, and thank you for being great partners in this program.
Thank you so much. I um I may have just one question um hanging back here, but just um because you've received federal money in this space before for diaper distribution. We have not received federal money. We've received state, county, and city money before. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I guess um yeah, because I, I guess um I mean I do understand a little bit of the legislative intent from the congressional level, but I guess what was helpful in securing that funding, um, you know, the first time through the state or the the local governments for you all. Oh, what, that's what, a, what really helped make the case, because I think that'll help inform participants in the future, you know, on like what data we should be collecting that, you know, is l low barrier um, and whether it's the organizations help the families out or not, like what what really helped make the case, I guess. Yeah, that's a really great question, Christian. I really appreciate it. Um, I think it's a multitude of things, and it really depends on the individual that you're meeting with. Um, some of the information that we collected was around like hospitalization and clinic use uh, for for symptoms related to diaper need. So I think exploring the cost burden that it has on the state or county's safety net to treat those. Uh, as well as the trauma and the mental health effects it has on the caregiver and child for going through that process and not being able to provide clean diapers. Uh, we looked a lot similar to what ACF is collecting on um, the health and mindset of the caregiver and child, the reduction in stress and anxiety, missed days of work and school, um, really simple kind of uh, um, what are they called? Uh, the general questions about kind of the quality of life for the individual and painting that picture. And I think the major thing that we continue to find success in is documenting the need that's much larger than the available resources we have. So we've had success uh, and conversations with local government and county government just in their community saying that we went and surveyed X number of family resource centers. They're serving X number of people and have documented that X number of people would be in need of diapers. Currently, we're able to serve 100, but that number is four or five times larger. So how do we start creating a pathway to ensure that over the time, because it's not going to happen in a month or a year, that we create a pathway for funds for like for those resources to become available? Uh, we traditionally start small uh, and we try to get champions. We try to get someone who really supports this type of intervention as our voice and have them bring forward that first ask and then continue to share the data as it's collected and painting that larger picture of the number of people who need resources. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And I think that's kind of um, as as we work with our sub grantees, I think that's along the lines of, yeah, kind of that mental and personal health um, outcomes too, um, and the stress and anxiety too. hopefully those positive outcomes coming out of the program, if if possible, if we can track that, you know, um, so that that makes a lot of sense. Awesome. Yeah, and Christian, we're happy to kind of do a brainstorming exercise or activity with you if you want to look at the specifics of uh, your community um, and maybe explore some of those pathways together. OK, sure. Great. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we could set that up. I mean, I have like a draft survey I'm going to send out with the four community action agencies that I'll be working with and, yeah. and get feedback but maybe it might be helpful to have a brainstorming session with all of us and and you all as well at supply bank there we would love that that would be a lot of fun okay cool yeah welcome to the team i know you weren't in when we first met with the group uh, back in october november so happy to set up a time if you want to email me some dates that work 
Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, happy to be on board. <laughs> get get up to speed. Great. And I see a question come through from Marcus. Has anyone had issues with the government survey? If we ask the recipients to use the same computer, they have to clear the cache before the next recipient can submit. Wow. This is really good feedback, Marcus. Um, if you haven't shared it with ACF, I would recommend that. We also can take that information and share it with them um, so they can blast it out to the other uh, state agencies and the partners. Maybe there's an internal process that they can go through to mitigate this moving forward. Great. Well, again, I just want to reiterate our appreciation for the space and the time to chat today. Uh, we look forward to continue working with you all uh, in the coming months. Feel free to reach out to Christian. She dropped her email in the chat if you have any direct follow up questions uh, or want to schedule some time to dive into a topic deeper. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.